Welcome everyone to the Health, Happiness and Planet podcast, where we explore different ways to boost your well-being, live a more fulfilling life and protect our planet. This podcast is sponsored by WAVE, Business Excellence Footprint, the digital training company that cares about your development and the well-being of this planet. You can find the courses for employees and managers on the website www.wave-bef.com. In today's episode, we are going to focus on the area of energy and happiness. I have the pleasure of having this amazing guest who lives in Texas, USA. Her name is Deborah Charns and she is a certified yoga therapist. She spent 50 years crisscrossing the world uncovering effective practices from gurus who spent a broad tapestry of religions, ethnicities and countries of origin. She felt compelled to share what took her a lot of time and money to learn. She just published her brand new book called From the Boxing Ring to the Ashram. Here, Deborah reveals her secret weapons to ease the most relevant conditions plaguing our modern society today. Each chapter focuses on the topic presented through life stories, teachings and anecdotes of one of her diverse gurus, plus her experiences with the enjoyable and accessible tools. These practices form the fabric of her life lessons and her teachings. Each tip is practical, affordable and takes no more than 10 minutes a day. There is no need for fancy gear or branded attire. She compiled this holistic toolkit to help people be healthier and happier while saving time and money. Her book transports the reader to the places she visited and connects them to her gurus. Deborah shares her lessons at therapeutic workshops in the US, Latin America, India and Italy. As a travel blogger, she published over 500 mind, body and lifestyle articles. I'm excited to introduce you to this amazing guest, Deborah Charns. Hello, Deborah, and welcome to the podcast. It is such a pleasure to be here because I know that your main focus areas are things that are near and dear to me as well. That's right. When I was uh, looking at your background, I was thinking, oh my gosh, it really links to so many things that I really promote here in this podcast with health, with happiness, with planet. That's exactly the same things you have been doing for so many years. And when I was a small kid, that was something that I always was wondering why some people are so happy and why other people struggle with it. And I always had that burning question and trying to find out what's the root cause of that. And somehow I thought I was the only voyager out there trying to find the, the answers to that. But I'm so happy that there are other people like you who also have, I would say, worked on that question and looking for those answers as well. And maybe we will hear some of those answers today. <laughs> well, I love your comment and I love the word you used, voyager. <laughs> because even though I may not have lived in as many places as you have, I have also always wandered around the world. And my background in college was social anthropology. So to me, I was always looking at cultures and trying to absorb cultures. And I very frequently was in very low socioeconomic level areas and yet I saw so much pure joy. Yeah. <laughs> so that to me is very important. And that's actually one of the concepts in my book that happiness is not about your bank account. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that's the same thing that struck me as well when I was thinking, how can it be when I travel in countries where they don't have so much resources, people don't have that much money, but they seem to be so positive and so happy about life. And then when I went to other countries in Europe, where they really have the government support, they have nice houses, nice cars, but people seem to be always in a grudgy mood. So I was thinking like, hmm, that's quite interesting. And that's where I started really asking more questions about this topic. Yeah. <laughs> so I will start with my first question, which I just love giving to all my guests, is to find out what is your passion and how did you find your passion? Is it something that you already knew early in life or is it something that you only discovered later on? I think I have a lot of passions <laughs> or several passions. And fortunately, I think they all finally congealed <laughs> together. One of my passions has been since I was 16 years old, I became vegetarian. At that time, I had never heard the word vegetarian. I had never met a vegetarian. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anything about ecology and the environment. 
It was just something that I felt I needed to do. So that's one passion. And then about that time, I got involved because of chronic pain. I got involved with breathwork and meditation, which of course are forms of yoga. Ultimately, yoga became my life. I am a certified yoga therapist. And to me, yoga for me is a lifestyle. I live a life of yoga from the moment I wake up until I go to bed. And then when I wake up in the middle of the night, it's still (laughs) all part of my yoga lifestyle. So that's passion number two. Number three is I have been a writer my entire life. I have always written professionally. I worked for my school newspaper. I worked for my school radio station. I worked in television and I worked in marketing communications my entire life. And I have been talking about the Voyager (laughs) or Voyages. I have been an independent travel writer since 2009. Wow. So then that goes to another passion of mine, which is traveling. (laughs) And I don't see myself as a typical tourist because, again, my anthropology background, I want to experience life in other countries. As an example, last year I spent three months working in Italy, as opposed to, oh, I'm going to take a week and go to a spa and whatever. That's that's not me. And then my final passion, which I think kind of brings them all together, is I really would like to make a difference in this world, even if it's one person. So true. As a yoga therapist, I work with one person at a time. And if there is one thing that I can steer someone to do to make a difference, to make them healthier or happier, that's good. And all of them, of course, congeal with my new book, which is From the Boxing Ring to the Ashram, Wisdom from Mind, Body, and Spirit. Fantastic. I really can resonate with all of those things you were mentioning because I also seem to have that multi-passionate chip in me. And a lot of those are also parallel to what you have just mentioned so far. So... That is really exciting, especially that you started, as you mentioned, to do this change of vegetarian diet in a time where people really did not know about that. But people were actually scared about it, thinking, oh, can actually you survive without eating meat or eating dairy? If I compare it to today, you know, everybody just goes to the supermarket. You have so many different options of selecting vegan or vegetarian. And it's so much easier for those who want to transition today compared to the times when you did the transition. I could imagine a lot of people thought you were out of your mind, probably. (laughs) Oh, definitely. I was always considered a rare bird (laughs) when I was the first one. I'm 65 years old. So this was almost 50 years ago that I became vegetarian. And it was bad enough in the United States with my family or with school, but I also lived in South America. So again, people, they they just didn't understand it. Well, that's a very interesting point that I will then come to later on in this conversation. I would uh, love to ask you this next question, which is, There's so many things that I have seen today in the modern world that is really shocking because there are a lot of people who suffer on depression, anxiety, recurring pains. Even though the so-called healthcare system, which I would just put in brackets, healthcare system is supposed to be getting better and better and we're supposed to get more advanced in the way how the body is working and how it functions, but somehow people are getting sicker and sicker. What is your point and observations on that? I talk about that a lot in my book from the standpoint of specialists and researchers, neuroscientists who have been studying PTSD, stress, anxiety, and depression for 30 years. You know, read my book to find out what they say. But what I would like to answer from myself, what I notice is as a yoga therapist, my way of yoga therapy is very much based on Ayurveda, which is the life science of India. It is a very ancient science, and it's tried and true. And the way that I look at this is that our society, and when I say our, of course, I'm living in the United States, but around the world, our society is changing. And as we become more modern and better, to me, we're going backwards. And I see that there are so many detrimental 
lifestyle habits, whether it be food. You know, there are so many things. I'll just talk about food for a second. One of the chapters in my book talks about diet. And even when I'm talking to my yoga therapy clients about diet, even though I'm, I'm actually vegan now and I don't eat gluten and I follow a low glycemic diet, I follow a very strict diet, I don't tell my clients to do that. However, what I do tell them is that they need to be conscientious of the source of their food. And it bothers me so much. Again, having lived in, I lived in both Mexico and Latin America, and it's so common in many countries still that people have their source of dairy or eggs in their yard. And it is a much healthier and humane form of how they treat the animals and what they ingest is natural. Whereas in the United States, all of our eggs are bleached. The factory farming is disgusting. Yeah. Aside from the fact that it's immoral, it's unhealthy to eat those products. And again, in other countries, it's more common that people will have their patches for garden. And I look back at my ancestors and I always tell people, I'm sure that their great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents all ate a much more natural diet. We didn't have microwaves. And hey, I use a microwave. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love the conveniences, but food was natural. We didn't have the pesticides. Even the idea of the source of your food, for example, let's say eating a banana in Iceland. Bananas are not grown there. They are picked far too early and then shipped very far. You know, it's always best to eat local for many reasons. And right. from an Ayurvedic standpoint, that's also one of the principles is that you eat local. I could go on and on forever about this. <laughs> right. And especially that you have the most nutrients because they also have more time to ripe. When they're unripened, put them already in the container to ship them across the world. And you're just eating things that are only have half of their potential. And that's why, first of all, if you have it locally, you don't have all the transport and all of that uh, carbon footprint that you're putting out there. But also you're just having fruits and vegetables that have better uh, nutritional uh, density. And that's very important. If I could talk about just one food item, <laughs> it's a food item that I love. And in the United States, I hate them. Avocados. Oh, yes. <laughs> there is a huge difference yeah. between eating an avocado in Latin America where they're grown and in the United States when you buy it from the grocery store. Yeah. In Latin America, I am satisfied with eating just an avocado with nothing on it for my dinner with a spoon. They're delicious. It's like butter. Yes. <laughs> That's true. I think nowadays as a consumer, it's always getting more and more difficult to make wise decisions. Yeah, it's, at the beginning, it was easy to say, oh, is it local or not local? Once we have the product in our hand to say, OK, what are the ingredients? Do I have to eat something that comes with a barcode label or can I choose something that is natural from the ground? And so it's just so many decisions that as a consumer, you want to think about and, and what systems you're actually supporting. As you said, if I'm going to get a, a banana and I'm in, in the other side of the world yeah, to think about what is the carbon footprint? And where does the banana come from? Does it come from fields of a country where people are being exploited and they're just being forced to work uh, or not? So these are all the things that really need to go through people's heads today to make Lisa a decision that it's good for us and for the planet. Absolutely. And I do talk about the planet in one of the chapters in my book, and it's talking about a sattvic lifestyle and diet. And sattvic is an Ayurvedic term, which means pure, but we don't mean pure. It's hard to explain what we mean by pure, but it is meaning that it's wholesome for your body and for your mind and for your spirit. And what we talk about in the chapter also is in terms of the carbon footprint of our meat industry, it is horrendous. And there's so much wrong with the industry in terms of big businesses in terms of you were talking about, you know, local farmers 
And we really don't have that much local farmers, mom and pop. And what I see in my book is it is no longer the farmer in the Dell or old McDonald. It is huge conglomerates that own everything. And I believe the percentage of meat and eggs, I might have this not 100% correct, but only 1% of the meat and eggs consumed in the United States are from small farms. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. It's, it's actually more shocking than amazing, yeah. Wow. One of the things that I found interesting, you said that as a consumer, when we eat food, it's also to be conscious about also how you feel after you consume the food. So one of the things is correct, yeah, to say we're going to get it in a natural way. Even if it's natural, let's say, for people to consume meat or to have dairy and eggs, but for them to also have the awareness, how do I actually feel afterwards? Do I feel more energetic? Do I feel sluggish? Do I have brain fog? Yeah, so all of these things people don't even ask themselves because for them it's just a normal state to have brain fog after eating. And that's something that, that I always had inside of me because before I used to eat a lot of meat and dairy. Today I'm also vegan since over nine years and I also somehow was able to see the drastic difference between how did I feel in those days when I ate meat and dairy compared to today when I feel just so energized and light as a bird and I can think well and I, I have different thinking patterns. Even the way how I ask questions is totally different. And these are things that you can only realize when you try both worlds to see what's the difference. Yeah, how is it like this and how is it like that? And then you can make a conscious decision for yourself to say, well, I would like to do more of this or not. And, and the other thing which I felt, because I seem to be a very sensitive person, the fear that is inside of an animal when they kill them, that also is transferred in the food society. There are a lot of people in stress, a lot of people in, in fear. And I think, well, that's also probably transferred from all of that meat that they're eating. Um, and besides that, there's also a lot of antibiotics that is in there, a lot of chemicals. So it, one can just go on and on and on with this topic, which is quite shocking if one really digs deeper. Yeah. I wanted to mention that I was diagnosed with digestive disorders when I was an adolescent. And for the most part, everything is controlled, not with meds, not with, to some extent, with diet, but more from my lifestyle, it is controlled because my digestive disorders are definitely stress related. However, when I was an adolescent, I was told by my gastroenterologist to do a log of what I consumed and to notice if the flare-ups were related to something I was eating. I never noticed anything. There was no difference. However, <laughs> <laughs> as a yoga therapist, I now lead series of therapeutic workshops for digestive health and for blood sugar management. These are three different ones. One is for blood sugar management, one is for digestive health, and the other is for weight maintenance or to lose weight. And I encourage, you know, when you slowly add in different foods where you, you know, elimination diets, where you really give yourself a lot of time to see how different foods respond. And what I realized with me, and I think this is true for so many people, is that the gluten that most people eat, especially in the United States, in Europe, there can be higher grades and purer forms. But most of the wheat that we eat is really bad for us. And again, it's the way that it's produced. Yeah. There are so many reasons why it's bad for us. But when you are used to eating it three times a day with every meal, it's normal to have bloating or to have rashes, you can have headaches, you can have brain fog. There are so many things and it becomes normal to you, which is why I recommend elimination diets. Yes, so true. I also had a lot of allergies in the past and well, I also happen to be now gluten-free and since then a lot of my allergies have disappeared. When I eliminated uh, dairy products, then 100% of my allergies were gone. Yeah, Before I had nut allergy, I had anything that would blossom out there, I would be sneezing 20 times every 10 minutes. So it was really, really bad. So I had to take medicine against all of these allergies. And I was thinking, well, it cannot be that I'm going to be living the rest of my life taking all this medication to control my cholesterol, to control my allergies, to bring down my blood pressure, all of the things that then later on just normalized by just changing the way how I was eating. And I was just totally amazing. 
The other thing that many people don't realize is there are many different food addictions. Of course, there is addiction to overeating, but there are many specific food addictions. One of the most common is sugar. Another one that is very common is carbohydrates. Another one that is very common is cheese. So there are different kinds of food addictions, but when our society tells us that it's right, again, I was raised at every meal, we even drank milk with every meal. Fortunately, we were not raised drinking soda, which to me is worse than, <laughs> than milk. <laughs> but we drank milk with every meal, and we had flour or gluten in every meal as well. Yeah. I sometimes think it's a miracle that our bodies were able to absorb all of that and still somehow make its way without getting more allergies or diseases or anything that could happen. And uh, that's why I'm so grateful to my body as well that it put up with me for the first 30 years where I was just doing things, I would say, differently to the way I do it today. And today I somehow feel I'm just getting younger instead of older. <laughs> and that's just by changing the way people eat. And, and a lot of people who I speak with, they just do not believe that you can make such a change with just the way how you change what's on your plate. Yeah. I wanted to mention that I really feel that I became my healthiest and my happiest after I was a senior citizen. <laughs> <laughs> I feel extremely healthy and happy now. And then the other thing I just wanted to kind of touch back on that you had mentioned before was about the mindfulness in eating. Mm -hmm. And too often our society is eat on the run. Now I recognize in Europe, it's very common that you can sit down for a meal for an hour, <laughs> <laughs> but in the United States, it's too common that we eat on the run or that we eat, we go to a drive through, we eat in the car, we eat by ourselves. What I mentioned, I really like studying and looking at different cultures. One of the concepts in Ayurveda is to eat silently, even though you're with people, but you have no oral communication. And the idea is so that you can savor your food. You can chew your food better. And it's all about mindfulness. And in one of my workshops that I do, I have a, a little exercise that I picked up from a book by Marianne Williamson. And it's such a beautiful exercise. And she talks about, go one day to the store and find one piece of whatever food item you want. But just, it has to be something special to you. So let's just say I go to the grocery store today and I find the most beautiful pomegranates, which we normally don't have. So she says, buy that one piece. Do not buy anything else in the store. You are only going in for one item. You bring it back. And when you come back home, you place it on your altar or someplace important to you. You keep it there for at least 24 hours. And then you schedule when you are going to taste it. Wow. That's and it, that's just so different from how most of us gobble down to feed our bellies. That's right. Even while you're driving a car, you're speaking with somebody on the phone and you're just uh, eating that hamburger and then you just get home and you're like, oh, I ate something. Yeah, okay, I'm not that hungry at the moment. And that is such an unconscious way of living life and also respecting the food. When I think about the years in the past, I used to be in, in the corporate world for many years and we had all these dinners with clients and I'm just thinking, well, everybody was so busy talking about business and trying to get that client. And I'm thinking, well, we have this perfect food here. It's so well cooked with, with all these nice chefs and people are not even realizing what they're eating because they're so focused on the conversations, on getting the deals. And I really felt bad about it. I, I was thinking it would be great if we could really savor this. And sometimes I even fell into that same pattern where I was so focused what they were telling me because I, I didn't want to be caught off guard. But then at the same time, I was thinking, oh my gosh, I, I'm not paying attention to what I'm eating. And that, and that was really not a nice experience. I worked in the corporate world too and for about 30 years and I did not enjoy going to these corporate or business dinners. Yeah, well, I would say 
What I'm very curious to hear about is your new book. And uh, it has an excellent title, From the Boxing Ring to the Ashram. The cover, it has boxing gloves that are hanging up inside a lotus flower. The subtitle is Wisdom for Mind, Body, and Spirit. The concept of my book was I pretty much wandered around the world, <laughs> not aimlessly because I always have an aim, but I did wander around the world. And in all of my wanderings, I came across incredible people who I consider my gurus. And my book compiles one key life lesson from each of my gurus. There are 12 gurus, 12 chapters, therefore 12 different concepts. One of them, for example, has to do with Ayurveda and the concept of Ayurveda as it relates to not only digestion, but your entire well-being, including emotional well-being. All from the concept of the gut is your engine, not just for digestion, but for absorbing all the nutrients and for processing everything. It talks about the gut brain microbiome. My book in general shares a lot of East and West knowledge. My gurus, for the most part, share traditions that are from older times, but they also share a lot of modern day knowledge and the wisdom. Um, some of my gurus, a lot of them have initials after their name, whether it be PhD or MD. And then in each chapter, I also did a lot of research to support all of the findings from my gurus as well. I have 150 footnotes and most of those are from research findings. That is so amazing. And did you go on to this journey knowing that you're going to write a book or did you first go into the journey and then later you found out, oh, I'm going to write a book about this? How was that experience to get to the point where you said, I'm writing a book now? <laughs> I think I've always been on a journey and I would say I'm still on a journey. <laughs> I don't want to ever stop learning. And at the same time, I don't want to ever stop sharing knowledge. The idea for the book came when I realized that I had so much knowledge from so many of my gurus that could be easily shared. And my choice when I created the book was to find these life lessons that people can pick up and adopt in as little as 10 minutes a day. For example, it can be a gratitude journal. When you wake up every morning, write down three things you're grateful for, or at the end of the day, write down three things you're grateful for. And there is so much evidence as to why gratefulness improves your well-being. That's powerful. Another example is what in yoga, we call it sometimes karma yoga or seva, S-E-V-A, which means selfless service. And people don't necessarily think about selfless service. They may think about volunteering. And most people, when they do volunteer, they feel really good about things. But the concept behind selfless service is to do something expecting nothing in return. Let's just say what I would have done before is I would say, okay, I'm going to help this nonprofit by writing press releases for them. But instead, if I go to the nonprofit and I say, what do you need me to do? And if they say, you know, we need all these papers to be filed, so be it. I do what they need, not what I want to do. Yeah. That's the concept behind selfless service. Another one of my chapters is about laughter as medicine. And it's incredible to see the findings of how laughter can cure chronic pain. It can ameliorate coronary disease, blood sugar imbalances. And of course, it's pretty obvious that it makes you happy. What is interesting is that some of the research findings have shown that simulated laughter is even more effective than instinctual laughter. Wow. Which means that if we just sit here right now and we just go, <laughs> if we just get some belly laughs out there, yeah. 
it's going to be extremely beneficial, not only for our emotional well-being, but it stimulates our lungs, it stimulates our abdominal muscles. It does so much for us. And on top of it, it's contagious because I already started laughing when you were laughing. So it's one starts, let's say, faking it. But then at the end, you set it out to the other people. They also start laughing and then you really start laughing from your heart. And that's quite interesting. That is exactly where what it's about. The founder of Laughter Yoga is a medical doctor. And he says, fake it until you make it. Yeah. Meaning the laughter. <laughs> And in my book, I give an anecdote of I was in India and I was at a yoga class. And it's very common in India, men are separated from the women. So there were about 200 of us women under one tent together. And the woman next to me, she just looked at me as if I were from Mars all the time. <laughs> I guess I was, you know, <laughs> because I was probably the only foreigner there. And the class, by the way, was in Hindi. And I could follow along because I know a lot of the Sanskrit terms for different yogic exercises. And she just kept on looking at me as if I was, shouldn't be there. <laughs> and I didn't feel good about that. And then at the end of class, he had a laughter yoga exercise. And we were supposed to look at the person next to us and point a finger at them and laugh. I was at the end, so I didn't have anybody on my other side. So 100% of my pointing was at her. <laughs> and at the end, I felt so comfortable with her and she was smiling at me. It was just beautiful in the end. That's such a nice story. One more thing that just reminded me about the topic laughter. I've seen a study, but that was many years ago that I read about it, that there were some hospitals that were hiring clowns to come and to entertain the children and to make them happier and laugh because they have realized that they can recuperate much faster. And uh, that would just give me right now a flashback to that article I was reading. Yes. And I have read or heard about that as well. It makes so much sense. The other thing you were talking about, how laughter is contagious. The other thing that's contagious mm -hmm. is a smile. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the chapters in my book, it talks about the boxer. It was a female boxer. And just like Muhammad Ali, she got punched too many times, had traumatic brain injuries and what is called dementia pugilistica. And it cannot be cured. She suffered from PTSD, but she also suffered from a lot of severe chronic pain. And she resolved all of her issues through state of mind and including gratitude and smiling all the time. And I also talk about how, again, studies, it's called social mimicry, how when you see one person smile, you smile. Here's an example also on, on the other side is if one person cries, you feel like you want to cry. I was just listening to a book on audio from a famous actor. It was his memoir. And when he got to a part in his life where his marriage dissolved, you know, I was, I was feeling so sad. I was like, no, I don't want you to divorce her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, but I was feeling everything with him. Yeah. And then he, he met the woman of his dreams who he's been with for 30 years. And I was elated when he talks about that. So again, I was feeling his emotions. Yeah, so you definitely have that empath superpower. <laughs> I think we all do. Some have it a little bit hidden. They have to find it and others see it at the beginning already of their life. And in my case, I had it quite present. And every time when I started to work in companies and for me, it was really hard to be in meetings because I was feeling what other people were feeling in that meeting room. And I was very uncomfortable. I couldn't even focus on the topic because I was just so focused on what the people were feeling. And I was just observing people thinking, okay, this is quite stressy. And then later I was thinking, what was the topic about? So I was a bit lost at the beginning, but then later I was exercising and trying to use that to my advantage. And then later I became a manager and a senior manager and I was able then to use that 
in a way that I always knew that I'm going to end my meetings that everybody's going to feel great. Everybody's going to feel happy and empowered and grateful that we completed another meeting and that everybody knows what direction we're going and that they're motivated about it. I've seen other managers, they're not so sensitive about that topic and they just say, okay, that's the project, that's what we're going to do and let's get on with the work. And maybe 50% of the people agree with it, other 50% are not so sure yet and they do not feel that. Yeah, So it's, it's really very, very uh, important to have that kind of feeling If you know this, that other people are not happy or if they are sad or depressed or confused, that you can somehow catch that and then just try to speak with them and work with them with that topic. Yeah. Well, I think what I have noticed in the workplace, because I was in the corporate workplace for a very long time, is I know I compartmentalized. I did not share any of my personal life or my personal feelings while I was at work. And I shut things out while I was at work. And I was at work seven days a week, 80 hours a day. It was very difficult. But it is so important that we acknowledge that every person has feelings. And one of the things that's beautiful about laughter yoga, for example, is bringing laughter yoga to the workplace when conferences or breaks between long meetings and of course using somebody who is trained as a laughter therapist or as a laughter counselor because it's not just about telling some jokes um, there's a lot more to laughter yoga than than laughing but it, it is so important and the other thing about the workplace another concept that is important to the workplace is selfless service And one of the research studies that I mention in my book assessed the concept of karma yoga, selfless service in the workforce. And it showed so many different reasons why it should be a part of the workforce. And I will say that at one point when I was in my career, I took on a lot of a lot of ad hoc duties that were not necessary. <laughs> one of them was I was kind of the green queen <laughs> and, and I initiated a lot of sustainability uh, practices for the entire office. But another thing that we did was we created, and this was because we had low morale. We had low morale for many years and it kept dipping, dipping, dipping. And one of the things that I did was I found a partnership with our local food bank. It was an amazing food bank. And we did corporate outings where we would all volunteer together at the food bank. And again, we're not doing professional things. We're packing boxes or unpacking boxes, but we all knew what it was for. And it was just a beautiful way to have some camaraderie. And I really do believe that things like that are so important. Yeah, that's right. Especially if, if you look at the studies from the blue zones where you have those cities or countries where a lot of people get over 100 years of age. Well, what are the factors that they do different to other countries? And yes, of course, the food is one of them. But the other factor is how much do they work together in a community? How is their relationships with other people, with their neighbors, with their uh, colleagues and friends? And all of that has advantage for your health and your mental health and spiritual health yeah, and how you communicate with people. Absolutely. And along that line, there have also been studies that show that any type of spirituality helps with longevity. And of course, in the blue zone, people have all different religions. <laughs> to me, it's not about religion, but more about the spirituality. And so often, the spirituality is connected to that sense of community. And that is extremely important. Yeah. One thing I'm very curious about, uh, it's about the title of your book, because I think now that you mentioned about the lady who was a boxer, I, I'm somehow putting the ducks together. How did you get to that wonderful title from the boxing ring to the ashram? You know, it's, it's not easy to come up with a title, and I probably came up with 30 different title names, and then you choose one and then go with another, and you shift back and forth. But I think boxing ring is not expected for a more spiritual, self-help, holistic type of book. And I think it is more eye-opening 
And then ashram, a lot of people might not even know what that word means. I had to which, look it up. <laughs> yes, which I think is good because there's a little bit of wonder about what it means. So it opens up the mind of, hmm, what is this about? And I will say that in my corporate career, even though I've been a pacifist my whole <laughs> life, I was never into boxing, but I promoted boxing matches for several years wow. in my professional corporate world. And I have to say, I enjoyed it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and my boxer in my book, my boxer mentor, it's a woman. She's the most peaceful lady. She's just amazing. And she is now a Tai Chi instructor. And everything about her e oozes yeah. tranquility. Beautiful, beautiful. And I'm also very curious about how was your interaction with your gurus? Were you there, for example, in a specific place with them for a duration of uh, certain weeks or days? How was that set up? If you could give us some insight on that. That's a great question. And with each guru, it's different. Mm -hmm. What I do with my book is every chapter has a similar format. And the beginning of each chapter introduces my connection to the guru. And then it talks about the guru's life challenges, because everyone has life challenges. And my gurus, most of them had pretty tough challenges. <laughs> and then it shares the guru's wisdom. And then it shares five easy tips from the guru. And then my experience with that life lesson and all the research that I have done to corroborate it. And then I give an example of how to give the lesson a try. So with the boxer, for example, the boxer is the only one that actually lives in my community. And we worked together. We were both working at a beautiful academy where they had both martial arts and yoga and Tai Chi. And that's where we originally met. And then we also worked together other places. That's one example. All of them have different examples. Some of them I met at the ashrams. Four of them live in ashrams. And of course, I've been to all of those ashrams. And how was your experience when you're in an ashram? Does everybody have like separate rooms or do you have one big room? How is it there? That's a good question. And it depends on the ashram. Oh. <laughs> the first ashram that I went to was in Northern California. Mm -hmm. And we had wooden cabins with bunks for, I don't know if it was for six or eight people. And they are always, of course, women and men. And usually it used to be that even if you are a married couple, the women would be together and the men would be together. That was the first place that I was at in California. And then I went to one in India. It was the same lineage, but in India. And my women's dorm probably had... 50 people, but we had separate connecting rooms. There were also some rooms that may have had just four people in a room, but mine was very large. Another one of the ashrams in India where I stayed, we were staying in permanent residences accommodations. So it was also more like two or three people to a room. And then, which is the fourth one? I'm trying to think, which is the fourth? Oh, the fourth one in Italy, there were 10 of us females to a room. It all depends. That's interesting. And everybody's in a community when you all have breakfast, everybody has breakfast together or everybody's like in their own world doing their own schedule or how is it usually the daily routines? For the most part, you always have meals together at a certain time. I will say that at two of the ashrams that I was at, the one in California and the one affiliated with it in India, I was there for specific training programs where they have a very set schedule where everybody must do everything in terms of waking up at a certain time, going to bed at a certain time, and everything is very regimented because we're in training. So there's a lot of things that we're doing. But for the most part, yes, you always have the communal meals and that's why it can be beautiful to have those meals in silence too.
And that way you can also sense what people are feeling when you're in silence and you're not always focusing on the conversations, but you're more focusing on like, how's the energy here in the room? Are we all feeling good as a team? Yeah, and, and we're all having our meal together and, and sharing this meal. And I need to try that someday, really to eat in silence with a group of people. I have not done that yet. Yeah, because somehow in today's society, when you have that gap of silence, somehow for people, it's painful. For them, it's like, oh my gosh, there's like a silence for 10 seconds. We better say something before they think that I'm rude. It's just like if something is wrong, if people are silent and it's interesting. I, just... <laughs> I remember the very first date I ever went on, it was horrible. <laughs> and, and for the longest time, I was trying to make conversation. And finally, I'm like, I have no desire to talk to this guy. <laughs> so the ride home, it was in total silence. But, but silence can be so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. If we accept it for the beauty. And one of the chapters in my book is about nada. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about nada is in Spanish, yeah. <laughs> but nada is in Sanskrit. Nada yoga. Okay. And for anybody that does not understand Spanish, the word nada <laughs> means nothing. But in Sanskrit, the word nada means sound. And in particular, sacred sound. And when we talk about sacred sound, there is also sacred silence. Just as it is so important to, let's just say, eat your meal in silence, when you are chanting or listening to music, or if you go to a concert and at the end of the song, once the applause dies down, if you just take a moment and relish that silence, it's beautiful. That's amazing. What I practice with my wife, we walk quite a lot barefoot outside in nature. For me, I just call it conscious walking because we're just focusing on the ground, where are we stepping and uh, how does it feel? Is there a different energy when we're walking by certain trees and so forth? And we're just so into it that we don't have to have any conversation at all. We can just be quiet throughout the whole one hour walk and we just feel so connected. It's amazing. If I can recommend another book to yeah. you. I read it in Colombia. I was at a silent meditation retreat. It's a book like this skinny and maybe this big. It's really little. And it's by Thich Nhat Hanh. And I read it in Spanish. It was called Como Andar. In English, I believe it's called How to yeah. Walk. And of course, we all think well, we know how to walk. <laughs> We've been walking since we were a year old. And I've done virtual book clubs reading that book. He just makes it so beautiful about focusing on the little things with everything you do, with every step, with every breath. Wow. It's a beautiful wow. book. It's so nice, especially in today's world where everybody seems to be so hectic. Every three seconds looking at the phone and checking if now an email came in. Okay, let's just take a break. We could have certain moments that we look at our messages. We can reply to them all at once. Then we put it back away again and we just focus on what we're doing because otherwise we're just constantly going to be taken away from our focus point. And if we're thinking about our future or if we're thinking about our new goals, how can you think about a goal or a future if you're constantly thinking, oh, I just got another message. Oh, that's another message. Oh, let me see again. And then... You already forgot about what was your goal that you're just reconstructing in your mind. My question to you is, what is your definition to happiness? I will go to my yoga background, and there is a word in yoga. It is one of the 10, I call them commandments. They're not commandments, but I, I liken it to the 10 commandments that we have in a modern day, but they are tenets. And one of them is santosha. It's a Sanskrit word, S-A-N-T-O-S-H-A. And the translation that we commonly attribute to the word santosha is contentment. And to me, contentment is so important. And in one of the chapters in my book, it's about one of my gurus, an ashram in Mumbai, and he talks about how happiness is not your bank account. And one of the examples that I give is that, according to research, the tipping point for how much money you need to be happy or to make a difference, it's $8 million. Okay. Meaning for 99.999% of us, <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> We need to be content with what we have. And one of the things that I mentioned is that for some people in some societies, 
They're not content unless they have a huge plasma TV until they have three cars and a three car <laughs> garage and a 4,500 square foot home and or a second home or a third home or a fourth home. And they're, they're never content. And then for other people, just being able to pay for gasoline, it makes a big difference and makes them happy. Or of course, as you know, so many people around the world have no vehicles, having a bicycle or having the physical ability to walk where you need to go. That can make you happy or content. And I have to admit, you know, I worked in the marketing industry for far too long. And I believe one of the major culprits is the marketing world where we are taught to teach people to consume, to consume, to consume, to buy, buy, buy things that are not needed and not necessary. The opposite from being minimalistic. Right. And we all want to outdo our neighbors. And I do mention in that one chapter about money doesn't buy everything. My give it a try is I'm not sure if you're familiar with Marie Kondo, who wrote the book Spark I Joy. Yeah. It's all about getting rid of everything. And, you know, you go through every item. Let's just say this pen. Does this pen spark joy in my life? No. <laughs> Get rid of it. That's right. So you only want remaining what sparks joy to you. We have done that exercise here at home, and it's so amazing. Just surround yourself with all those things that bring you joy and happiness and nice memories. And if there's something that is just linked to something that you have had a negative experience with, then, well, why do I need to have it there? I don't need to be reminded over and over again about that negative experience. If I look my life before and my life today, it's just changed 180 degrees, Yeah, like becoming more minimalistic. And I also don't have a watch on anymore. Like before, I used to love watches. Yeah, <laughs> so it's like the less you have somehow, the more content you feel. And the more you have, the more unhappy you are because you also have to maintain all of the things. And if you have three cars and you have to bring them three times today, inspection you got to wash them all you got and there's so much work connected with each object that you have and uh, i have one last question for today it's not an easy question but it's a very interesting one tell us about one of your eye-opening moments in life one of those aha moments that made a deep impact and a shift in your mindset i think it will be what got me to leave the corporate world i always felt that I was selling stuff that I didn't consume. Again, I worked for the major multinational brands. I was vegetarian my whole adult life. I didn't drink any alcohol. I didn't take any prescription drugs. I avoided all the packaged foods. And my clients were you know, <laughs> all those major companies that do all yeah. of that. And I knew that. And I felt, okay, you know, this is my paycheck, right? And I had to support my family. And then there were two weeks in a row when my local ashram in Texas, there were two different speakers. I was teaching yoga at the ashram. And after my teaching yoga, there would be a lecture. And there were two different people, two different weeks. And both of the lectures touched upon and I can't think of how they phrased it, but it was basically, I don't want to say this, but it was something like contributing to evil. It wasn't evil, evil, but contributing to things that are not good, right? And again, these were two totally different people. And in both of those lectures, I thought, what am I doing? Everything I'm doing is pushing products and services that I don't believe in, even let's just say diapers, I'm not saying people shouldn't use diapers, but I'm sorry. <laughs> when my daughter was little, I hand washed and hand hung out to dry sometimes 30 cloth diapers a day. She didn't wear disposable diapers. You know, I just felt everything that I was pushing was something I didn't believe in. How could I be content? You know, I felt like I was doing the devil's work. And that was when I decided to leave the corporate marketing communications world. And I opened up my own company and I don't have my business card with me, but the tagline when I opened up my business was something like dedicated to positive transformation. So I only took on clients. Most of them were nonprofit that I felt were contributing to our community instead of ruining 
actually going to be my next question for you. Do you know any marketing company who only accepts clients who are doing good in the world? And I think you almost already answered that with your own company. <laughs> I opened up my own company in 2011 and I didn't know of any others at the time that were doing that. But of course, I did not do it from a marketing standpoint or from a business standpoint. I knew that my income would be drastically reduced. It's just like when you're investing and when you choose to only buy stocks or bonds that you know are ethical. That's really amazing, especially that later on you really aligned yourself with your vision and your mission that you have and you went away from getting a better salary and especially that you are such a conscious person knowing the life cycle of all of these products. You know that some of these products are just going to be used for a couple of minutes or maybe days or weeks and then after that, what happens to it? What is the life cycle of that product when it has been disposed of? Does it land in some landfills? How long does it take to disintegrate and so forth and so forth? And then it gets even more scary because that's the type of thing that people do not want to hear about. It's always like that curtain to close that nobody needs to know what happens after that. You just throw it into the garbage and it will be taken care of. And unfortunately, that is not always the case. Yeah. It's amazing how our time went by so fast. We're already one hour in this podcast and I just feel like we're just speaking for 20 minutes. <laughs> I have one final point which I would like to ask and that is where can our listeners find you? Because I'm sure there are a lot of people who will resonate with all the things you've said. And they would also probably love to read your book, including myself. I'm definitely going to be ordering your book. Please tell us where we can find you. I have multiple websites. My marketing communications website is the, T-H-E, write, like you write, counsel, like a legal counselor, so C-O-U-N-S-E-L.com. My yoga therapy website is the same thing, but instead of write, it's namaste, so the namaste council. My author page for my book is my name, debracharns.com. My YouTube channel and my Instagram are also my name, Deborah Charns. And then I have Facebook accounts for both the Right Council and the Namaste Council. So I'm everywhere. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And do you know, is your book also going to be on Amazon or where can we order your book? Yes, my book is definitely going to be on Amazon and most other places where you prefer to buy books. And my website also has a link for online orders as well. Even better. I will also put all of your links on the show notes. So for whoever is listening to this podcast, is driving or doing anything else, then they can just click on the links in the show notes. And for now, well, I was so delighted to have this conversation with you, Deborah. It was amazing. And I also feel that definitely we have a lot in common. And that's why it was such a joy to speak with you today. What a great conversation. I hope this episode with Deborah has made you conscious about the way we fit into society today and to reflect whether we are doing the right things for our body, mind, spirit and for our planet by incorporating new empowering habits. I encourage you to pick at least one action point from today's episode and see how it positively impacts your happiness. For myself, I'm going to use the technique Deborah shared with us from one of her gurus, where I will smile at people when walking outside. I will also prioritize to laugh more. Tell me what you have tried and what you have experienced and tag me on Instagram. My account is called health underscore happiness underscore planet. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. In the show notes, you will find all the links on where to find Deborah and how to contact her. And you will also find her amazing new book called From the Boxing Ring to the Ashram. Wisdom for mind, body and spirit. This podcast was sponsored by Wave Business Excellence Footprint, a digital training company that cares about your career development, your personal development and the well-being of this planet we call home. On the website www.wave-bef.com, you will find a total of 22 courses. Seven of those are designed for managers and 15 courses are designed for employees who strive to become the leaders of tomorrow. I value your feedback and I would love to hear from you. Please rate, subscribe and share this episode with your loved ones. Your support means the world to me and it motivates me to keep producing content that adds value to your life. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Big hugs, everyone.